Hello, everyone. Um, I'm very excited to talk to you today. I saw when you were asked who has been to an AIDS conference that most people haven't been. And I want to tell you that I know exactly how you feel. I am um, a journalist from South Africa, and the newspaper that I write for is called The Mail and Guardian. It's a weekly newspaper that's mostly um, that a lot of policymakers and political leaders in my country um, read. But my other job is I'm a journalism lecturer at a university in South Africa called Rhodes University in the eastern part of my country, and um, it's in a small town called Grahamstown. It's the smallest university in the country, but it has the largest journalism department. And we have a health journalism program there, and so, so that, that's my other real job. The, the newspaper at the moment is sort of just more of a part-time thing for me. Now, um, before we get to that, um, I have started to report on AIDS in around about 1996-97. And people always ask me, don't I get tired of reporting on AIDS? And it sometimes invigorates me because I really don't. Because for me, AIDS is like a mirror of the world. It tells you what's going on in the world. And to me, it tells me about what's wrong in the world. It highlights prejudices. It tells you about racial prejudices, about people who are homophobic, um, sexual prejudices. It tells you when a government isn't doing its job properly. And it also highlights the gap between rich and poor in society, who's got access to stuff and who doesn't. So for me, AIDS is a really sort of a bigger thing than just the this, this sort of aspects that you report on. It gives you a real picture of the world. And in that respect, it's always stayed interesting to me. I don't believe that an AIDS story should be in the media if it's boring or if it's not well written. Um, just because it's on a devastating epidemic, to me, doesn't give it any right to be in the media. It only deserves to be published if it's written well. And that's why we have journalists have such a big responsibility to apply our journalism skills and make sure that our stories are interesting. And it really is possible to write an interesting HIV story, and it really is possible to make it compelling. Now, I want to tell you about my first AIDS conference, because I think that is how many of you are going to feel tomorrow when you walk into, or you know, when you start reporting on the conference. It was in 1998 in Geneva in Switzerland. I was working for the South African Broadcasting Corporation, and I was a radio reporter. And I really didn't know a lot about AIDS, um, especially not about the science of AIDS. But an organization gave money to the SABC, and there off I went. And when I walked into the media room, I was overwhelmed. At that time, not many developing country reporters attended AIDS conferences. And what did I see when I walked in? I saw teams of reporters from developed countries. You would look at a UK newspaper or American broadcast um, media house, and it would not just be one person reporting on the AIDS conference. They would have a team of five or six people. You know, they would split up the tracks that Marjorie um, mentioned. You know, each person would cover a track, or, you know, that, that planning was so, th their reporting was really well planned beforehand, and they had lots of resources. You'll see when you walk in there, you may just, you know, be fighting over a space for your computer. There will be corporations, media corporations, that have booths, you know, or three or four booths, and that's their office in the media room. Um, the other thing that was really overwhelming was that at any given time, there was 20 or 30 things to choose from, to report on, and how on earth do you know what to choose? And you always feel that you're missing someone. I sort of ran around from one place to the other. Um, and as, as Michael has mentioned, there's always more than one press conference on at a time. And that becomes pretty intimidating and overwhelming, because I'm sure um, most of you are the only one from your media house here, right? That's going to report on the conference. And it's a very, very different sort of challenge if you're the only person, as opposed to being part of a team. And then there's going to be a 
lots of tables full of press conferences. Every morning or every time after lunch that you walk in, there's going to be 30 or 40 new press conferences. And how do you choose? We're going to get to how to choose. But I just want to give you an idea of what you're going to face. And then, of course, there are various space for computers with internet access. I suppose it would probably be a lot of wireless as well. And when I was in Geneva, people fought over computer spaces. You know, there's never enough for 2,000 journalists. So if you walked in in the morning and you left and you went to a session, when you came back, you may not have had your space. So that was really overwhelming for me. But there is a way to get around this. I attended a, a meeting, a training that year, um, like you guys are, are attending this one. And there was a reporter from the Boston Globe. It's, a, it's an American newspaper, and she was quite an experienced health correspondent. Her name was Huntley Collins. And the thing that I remembered most from that training and the best advice that anyone ever gave me was that it, 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 you don't have to cover everything and that it's OK to miss things. It's not that great a deal. Now, if you remember that, you will not be nervous throughout. It's going to be stressful, and you will miss things, because there's no way that you can attend to everything at this conference. And realistically, how many stories can you file a day? How many stories do your editors expect you to file? One a day? Two? Two? Two or three? You know, it depends who you work from, and we're going to talk, uh, four, um, we're going to talk about it in a bit. But, you know, you can't send them five stories a day. They're not going to publish it, or all of it. So don't aim to do that. It is, you don't have to attend five sessions a day. Then you may ask, well, you know, if you don't attend you know, many, many sessions, why are you at an AIDS conference? Now, mainly, you are here to make contacts, to learn who's who in the AIDS world. And... Um, you are here to learn about the basic science of AIDS, but do not try and figure out all the science of AIDS or HIV at this conference. It's not the place to do it. You're going to be under deadline. You're going to have to write stories. It's OK if you don't understand everything. A conference is a place to be exposed to matters, and those you don't have to figure out everything here. You can make notes and figure it out when you're back home. Then you know what questions to ask whom. And you're also, of course, here to build a profile for yourself, because we all know, we journalists, we have egos, and if you report from Washington, D.C., from a conference back home, people think you're more important, right? So, <laughs> so it's a good thing to be at the conference, but let's look a little bit at what do you do. Well, as I have mentioned, um, if you don't have a good understanding of the science of AIDS, just give me an idea. Who of you have reported on the science of AIDS extensively? So there are like two or three people, but most of you haven't. And when I say science, I mean if you're going to sit in a scientific, abstract-driven session, you're going to be at a session where there's maybe five or six scientists that may talk, say if it's about antiretroviral drugs, they're going to use words like proteus inhibitors, they're going to use words like nucleotides, non-nucleotides, they're going to say is 3TC, which is a type of ARV, better than you know another type of ARV, you're not going to understand what they're saying. Now, I by no means imply you shouldn't learn about those things, but I am saying be realistic. You added a conference where you're going to face deadlines, go to sessions that you think you'll be able to figure out a little bit. So if you have absolutely no, uh, if, you, if you're really uncomfortable with the signs of HIV and you want to write a good story and you have deadlines, it may make more sense for you to go to, a, 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 if it's an abstract session, to the one about political or social science. Um, it's it's going to be very hard for you to understand the scientific ones. However, there may also be scientific sessions that are at satellite sessions. You heard Marjorie mention satellite sessions. Now, the difference is, is with a satellite session, someone didn't submit research. So it means someone basically, you pay to have the session and to address a, a subject in a way that you believe is important. And those sessions are often easier for a journalist to understand who's not that experienced in HIV reporting. It's also easier to get someone afterwards at those sessions to explain something to you personally and to, to give you a bit of time. 
Then remember when you go to a session, this is a lot of information that you're going to be bombarded with. It's okay not to understand everything in a session, and it's okay not to report on everything. You can choose one aspect of a session to report on. So say if it's about male circumcision, and there's someone talking about medical devices that you can use for male circumcision, and there's someone talking about, say, um, you know, how do you get communities that traditionally don't circumcise to circumcise, and let's say you don't understand the science of the medical devices, which can get pretty tricky sometimes. Leave that bit. Focus on the bit that you understand and go and ask that person afterwards, you know, a little bit more, rather than getting it wrong. Now, when I say ask, you're not going to be able to ask five speakers in a session to, you know, give interviews to you. You may be able to get one. So that's why it's important to decide what your story is going to focus on in that session and stick to that aspect. And then um, Michael mentioned that some of the sessions will be webcast. You all know what webcast sessions mean, right? They will record it on video and they'll put it online. And you'll be able to listen to that session afterwards. Now, I have been to most of those conferences since 1998, but I didn't go to the Vienna one last year. But at the Mexico one before that, what I found most useful of those recordings was that they actually transcribe the sessions. They type it out word for word. I, I hope that's the case at this conference. And of course, it takes a while before they can put it on because it takes a while to um, transcribe a session. But that really helped me because it often meant that I didn't have to listen through the entire session. If I knew someone said something and I wanted to quote it word for word, I could just go to the transcription and quickly, you know, I could copy and paste basically the quote. And that really helps you if you, if you need a quote on a certain thing and, and you need to find it really quickly. Now, what do you think your editors want from you on this conference? Well, that obviously depends on who you work for. I'm very aware that if you work for a radio or television station, it may be different from a newspaper, and even newspapers, whether it's daily or whether it's a weekly newspaper, will, will be different, you know, what you're going to give them. But it's important or it's useful to remember that all the big wire news services will be here. Reuters will be here, AFP will be here, AP will be here, and they will file all the big stories very quickly, almost certainly every single time before you are able to do so, right? Because they work in teams of people. So if you want to file interesting stories or if you want to choose how to allocate your time, your editors may sometimes not want you, you know, to necessarily write about the main plenary session because if they want it in the newspaper, they can probably grab it from a wire. Um, so you may want to think about, you know, what is your editor's specific interest. But I have often found that, you know, it's not necessarily the main stories that my editors back in South Africa want. They want to see things that specifically relate to the continent or they want to see things that relate to my country. So I'm not saying don't go to the main sessions. I'm saying it's not always necessary to go to them. It doesn't mean that you're going to miss the story of the year if you miss one of them. The interesting thing, I want to tell you a story when I, there's another conference like this, it's smaller, but it's an African one, it's called the International Conference on AIDS in Africa. And there was a year that it was held in Zambia, and I was working for the television news part of the SABC. And every day I ran around, you know, to get the plenary session and, you know, record the speakers or get people afterwards. And my editor called me, and I was so scared I was going to miss something at the conference. And he said, you know what, I, I don't want those stories that you're filing. They, you know, they're very formal. Can't you just file real stories? And I didn't know what he meant. And you know what he meant? There was a UNICEF site visit on the, that was organized for one day for journalists that took us out to the streets to interview children orphaned by AIDS. And of course, I missed half a day of the conference when I went on that session. But there were children's voices in my story. And you know, then, then some of the people talked about what they do to help these children orphaned by AIDS. And that night, my editor was so happy with me because I gave him a real story. Of course, that meant that I was missing many sessions at that conference. I'm telling you this story to say it's okay to miss sessions. You really don't need to run after every single session. 
Often the story that your editor is going to want back home is a human story. And where are you going to find human stories here at the AIDS conference in DC? Do you know? The global village. You need to hang around in that global village. You're going to find interesting stories and stories that you won't be able to do back home. Because if you're from one country and you get a, you know, an interesting person from your neighboring country here, you, you know, it's, it's something that it, this gives you access to it that you wouldn't have had access at home. Um, stories that you get here at this media training, make notes when people are going to talk to you about subjects. It's often stuff that you're going to want to file a story about. Your stories don't all have to come from formal sessions. You're not at the conference to always only file a story about a session. It can be an interview with someone that you met at the conference, right? It's just the exposure that you get to the people. And I saw on the program there's a guy coming to call, uh, talk to you, Chief Mumena from Zambia. He's a truly interesting story. I did a story for him on him on, for this Friday in our newspaper as a preview to the conference. Chief Mumena comes from a group in Zambia called the Kahundi people, and the Kahundi people don't circumcise. Now, you've all heard about male circumcision and how it can help you to prevent to get infected with HIV if you're a man. Have you all heard of it? Now, of course, there are many campaigns going on in Africa. There are 14 African countries that have been selected that gets extra help to, to circumcise as many people as possible. But what do you do when you come from a an ethnic group where people don't believe in circumcision. In other words, they don't believe in circumcision as a right to, as a passage to, to manhood. Now, Chief Kahunda, our Chief Mumena, comes from the Mumena people, which is part of the Kahundi people, and they don't circumcise. And his main job is to protect the culture of the Mumena clan. And then one day, his, uh, his son came to him because his son had heard about HIV and, and, and male circumcision and said, Daddy, I want to get circumcised. And he was in an incredibly different, difficult position because how do he, does he as a chief tell someone, his son, you know, you're supposed to protect the culture of the, of the clan to get circumcised. Now, I'm not going to give you the story away, but you may want to hear his story. He's a great person to, to write about. So there you would already have one um, human interest story, right? And in terms of filing, well, I personally file it, find it impossible to file more than one or two stories a day. Um, it's more like one. I work for a weekly newspaper now, so my story is more sort of about the story uh, behind the story. If you work for a daily newspaper, my advice would be, you know, really try and fill one proper story rather than three ones that you feel you're running around and you can't get it done. If you think about if a session is an hour and you need an hour or two to write the story afterwards, you know, do your time planning. You probably can't really more, do more than two a day. If you work for a radio station and you're just going to, you know, write news items for a news bulletin, if that's the type of your, well, that you're what your radio station does, you could probably do more, but just be realistic. Don't try and, you know, you can't fill five stories a day, and just remember that. <coughs> then in terms of how you choose which session, you really need to take that program book and decide beforehand what you're interested in. I think it's very useful, that roadmap that Marjorie mentioned, that you can say, well, you know, you um, maybe you're interested in male circumcision, and then it gives you all the sessions that are on male circumcision. You're not going to be able to. There are 70 sessions on male circumcision at this conference. I think 72. You know, you can maybe go to two. That's the that's reality. The rest of it, you may, be, you may also, you're not going to report all the information at the sessions. What you are going to do is you're going to report some of it, and then you can do stories when you get back home to use some of that information that's left. Um, it often helps me to work from the media room because that's how I know I wouldn't miss something. I don't go to all the sessions, but there are TVs with all the press conferences. And you know what? If you're scared you're going to miss something, it's really not going to be that bad. But if there's something really major, you know, if there was people having a major protest or that sort of thing, you'll know about it if you're in the media room. Everyone will talk about it and there will be press releases about it. It's unlikely that you would miss a major, major event unless you go shopping, right? <laughs> but <laughs> at the conference, you're probably going to see it. You don't have to be that scared. 
I have a few story ideas. I'm just going to just the last two um, for you. Um, when um, Michael spoke about um, the science and the funding, the conflict of that at the moment, um, when he talks about the science, do you know what the major scientific developments have been? I'm going to give you two major ones. The one is male circumcision, and everyone is trying to give money to that because it's a relatively cheap intervention for the sort of effect that you get, you know, because um, there's studies. The, the initial studies showed that you can reduce a man's um, risk of getting infected by HIV with 60% um, from a woman. It's, it's, not a, it's, it's, it's when it's, it's about female, male and female sex. Um, but later studies in my country, South Africa, have shown that that may even increase, that, that that risk may even reduce over years. At the moment, the figure is 76 percent that I looked at male men who were circumcised three, year down, three years down the line, and it's, you know, your risk is 76 lower, is percent lower to get HIV. And um, there are 14 countries, like I've mentioned, in Africa. My country is one. Um, it's mostly um, southern and eastern African countries that have been selected by the World Health Organization, but particularly the U.S. government as well. The U.S. government gives the most funding, the, more funding than anyone else for male circumcision. And they're trying to get these countries to circumcise 80% of men between 15 and 49 before 2015. Now, there are a range of stories to tell around that. You can just sort of like look at the sessions. One of it is how do you get people who don't circumcise to circumcise? Even more difficult is how do you get people who circumcise to circumcise in the way that you want them to circumcise? In my country, many, many ethnic groups circumcise, but they don't remove the entire foreskin. And in all these studies that have been done, they only know, they don't know what happens, you know, if it's effective or not effective if you only remove part of the foreskin. But all the studies looked only at what happens if you remove the entire foreskin. So how do you tell a group where there's a traditional circumciser and just circumcision is much more than a medical thing, it's a, it's a tradition and it's a culture, and you tell them you have to, you know, do it differently, or worse, you get a doctor or a nurse to do it. Um, it is, it, is, it is a very, very difficult situation. So that's a story to tell. And there are medical devices at the moment. None of these countries have managed to, you know, are on track to do the 80% of circumcisions. So there's going to be a session. I actually put some forms in front for you because I, I found them at my hotel. I think it's on Tuesday where African <coughs> leaders are going to talk about, you know, how they feel about circumcision. But there's also going to be someone talking about medical devices. The World Health Organization is likely to approve a certain device um, early next year. It's called the Prepex advice, device. And it will, um, people are hopeful that it would make um, circumcisions a lot cheaper and a lot quicker to do. So, you know, maybe they can do it quicker. It wouldn't replace surgical circumcisions, but it would sort of complement it. Then the other big scientific development is treatment as prevention. Have you heard of that? There are two things with regards to treatment as prevention. The one is that they have found many studies at the conference that Michael mentioned, you know, about um, the previous, um, I think, last year or the year before, last year, um, is that if you start to treat someone very early for HIV, you make the virus in their body a lot less. They call it the viral load. The viral load would drop. And that person is a lot less likely to infect other people. But there are issues around this. It's the funding issue. It means you would have to give a lot more people um, antiretroviral treatment. And how do you make that decision? It's fine in America where people can, you know, everyone has a treatment that they need. But what do you do in Africa or in another developing country where people that have treatment, where everyone that desperately needs the treatment <coughs> don't even have it? So those are the issues around it. And you can look at your own country, you know, sort of what would be your policy around this. The other treatment as prevention issue is called PrEP. Have you heard of the word PrEP? Stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis. Basically means that if you're HIV negative, you can take ARVs, a certain type, two ARVs called Truvada. Truvada consists of, a, it's one pill, but it has two ARVs in it. And you can drink it and prevent yourself from getting infected. It's not 100% foolproof, but you know, it reduces your risk significantly. There are lots of nice issues around this because you need to know that someone who uses PrEP is HIV negative. And what do you know about HIV testing? There's a window period, right? Um, and you can't give someone PrEP 
if you don't know that they're negative. So that's a very difficult thing. And what do you know, in your countries, in my country, we've had a major HIV testing campaign, but millions of people still haven't been tested for HIV. So how do you even think about PrEP if people don't go for tests, right? I mean, how do you get people to actually... And you can't just go for one test. You must constantly be tested, right? Because what if you have sex after you've had... Um, and, uh, if you have unprotected sex after you... I got tested for HIV, it becomes complex, right? Um, you can get infected again. So people sort of, countries would like to get people to get tested once a year, and um, at least. So um, that's an interesting thing, and you know that the FDA in America is the first country that approved PrEP treatment last week, just, just before the conference, or was it earlier? I think it was earlier this week, actually. Um, so that's a good thing to look at. And sort of, you know, how do you give people who don't even have HIV um, access to, to antiretroviral treatment in countries where sick people don't even have it. Then another story idea, just quickly, is HIV in DC, here in Washington, DC. You know that the infection rate is incredibly higher. It's higher than in some African countries in this town. And um, there is someone who's going to talk about, I see, about um, Dr. Gregory Papas, about. Um, HIV in DC. That's a nice story to do if you come from Africa, you know, and you wanted to compare it. Um, there's, a, there's an interesting story to tell about it. The last thing I wanted to say was, um, as the last word is, don't try and get complex at the AIDS conference. Report on, you, on what you understand. Leave the rest for later. You know, try and figure out issues that you don't have time to figure out here. Make a note of it, you know, and ask someone that you know in your country, a doctor or a scientist, to explain it there. So you can get lots of story ideas at this conference that you can report on later on. You don't have to do all the stories while you're here. It's really not, not necessary or required. Thank you. Hello, Mia. Um, I'm Matuba from South Africa. I work for E! News Channel. I would like to ask you to maybe say something about responsible reporting when it regards to AIDS and HIV, because we've had instances in South Africa where there was like irresponsible reporting where, for instance, where there was a, um, a lady who, was, who tested in a public hospital and they told her she was positive, whereas she tested later she's negative. And the way people reported on it, and it made people more wary of going to test and so forth. And we also had a story of HIV test kits that were faulty that the government distributed to people. And that was reported irresponsibly, in sure. my opinion. So I would like you to please say something on responsible reporting. Sure. Um, can I respond? Um, thank you, Matuba. Um, those are two very, very good points that you've raised, those two stories. Um, I think it's incredibly important that we report on the signs of HIV accurately. And we don't always understand all of it as journalists, so it means ask someone. Um, the stories that Matuba mentioned, Matuba, the first one was the woman at the public hospital and the second one was the HIV tests, right? Just to give you an example, just before I left the country, and Matuba obviously as well, um, a story exposed our government um, that it bought, it paid a tender for HIV tests that aren't reliable. Um, they don't give you the wrong ex result, but they have been proven to give you an indefinite result. And there was lots of questions around, you know, if you go for HIV test, you know, did you get the right result? Now, some of those stories reflected that you would actually get the wrong result. Some of the, and you wouldn't, it was an indefinite result, but there's a policy that if you go for a HIV test, for a rapid test in any country, but in my country particularly, you, if you test positive, they'll use a different test to confirm your result. So it's highly unlikely that anyone would have received the wrong result. It's wrong that the government bought those tests. But an irresponsible way to report on it would have been to try and discourage people to go for HIV testing. You should have given them the right information to explain, no, you know, they're going to do away with these tests. But even if you did go while well, they were using these tests, it's unlikely that you would have received a wrong result. Um, so we need to be sensitive to those things, to not discourage people then to go for testing. And I think the other story that you mentioned, Matuba, was... A woman who went for an HIV test and actually did test negative, positive, I think, and then she turned out to be negative, right? I read those stories, and it was really irresponsible because this woman actually started on ARVs. That's the one in Move magazine, right? And if you know about ARVs, you would know that before you go on ARV, someone would have done a CD4 count test, which is like a measurement of your immune system, and they would all of a sudden have done a viral load test. 
And I don't understand how someone gets to be put on ARVs if they're CD4 counts and their viral loads, you know. Um, surely you wouldn't have a viral load if you don't have HIV. So it really didn't make any scientific sense the way in which that story was reported to me. And I think it's very important that we make sure that you understand the scientific processes behind it. I certainly don't understand all of them, but I make sure that I ask someone. Uh, my name is Edgar Timani. I represent the Sunday Standard uh, weekly newspaper in Gaborone, Botswana. Will be, uh, the challenges that we, you faced as a reporter, uh, reporting around AIDS issue, because I, <clears throat> I must thank you to say that AIDS, the AIDS issue is not just about the disease being there. Uh, there are these sensitivities that exist. Uh, I interrupted you uh, a while ago when you're talking about AIDS in the DC, and I was, I, I was just chipping in and I said, uh, uh, the prevalence is high among blacks and people get you know, uncomfortable with that. And if that is the reality that we have to face, science will never lie to us. Uh, what, what, do you, I mean, what are your experiences regarding these cultural sensitivities and political sensitivities? I'll give an example. In your country, South Africa, we know that uh, there is an unsafe uh, male circumcision which claims the life of many, uh, um, one tribe, I, I don't know if there's someone from that tribe, uh, who every year die out of uh, uncontrolled uh, HIV, um, what do you call, uh, circumcision uh, rights that, that, that take place there. The other one would be about political sensitivities. We know that in our prisons, Botswana being one of them, uh, there is this political denial that sex actually happens in prisons, and there's this huge reluctance to provide condoms in prisons for male prisoners. I uh, thank you. Thank can you. I, can, um, can I just do yeah. a follow-up on, sure. on what he said? Because this is one of the things that I am scared of. Uh, he's from Botswana, I'm from South Africa. And he, the use of your words, he said, many people die. I can say 18 people die. Last year, five people die. So we must be very careful of talking about things that we really we know. And another thing I want to point out is that there's a fine line between accepting the reality and also promoting stereotypes. So when people are sensitive, there should be something to back up and say, this is why we say black people die more, more people, black people die of AIDS because of one, two, three. So there's a fine line between stereotypes and research, concrete research that says black people, just saying black people playing die of AIDS without supporting it, that's bad journalism. Uh, I'm not, I have not come to any conclusions here. I was asking her what are the challenges she's faced along those uh, examples that I've just gave. I have not come up with anything conclusive evidence to say, yes, this is what is happening. But we are saying that the reality is there. How do you address it? What were you, uh, the challenges you faced? You're calling it a reality. Um, you see, that's my problem. There can be a reality without quantifying that reality to what extent it is, but the existence is, is she's there. Okay, we, we have to find, let's see what we have. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a very interesting discussion. We're going to have lunch all together in the cafeteria. I would like to acknowledge your point. I agree those are challenges, and Matubas were as well. To tell you, to give you an example, I, when I worked at the SABC, our public hospitals, I come from a country with a, with a lot of um, racial sensitivities. At the time, it was in the late 90s, early 2000s, there was a lot of stories about the prevention of mother-to-child transmission to, to be told in the public sector. Now in my country, because of all our histories and all of those things, the, the public health sector is mainly used by black people. And I worked for television, so it's a visual medium. And whenever I went to HIV clinics in the public sector to film babies or mothers, you know, at the clinics, they were black. And it became an issue at the SABC because it, you know, it created the impression that only black people got infected with HIV. White people did too, maybe often to a lesser extent, but they weren't at the public hospitals, you know, I didn't know where to find, I mean, I could go to private clinics, but the same issues didn't apply in terms of access to treatment. Now, I really don't have the answers to all of this. What I did in that case, I made a point of doing a story about the white population, you know, which was more in the private sector, and the fact that, you know, that HIV infection rates in South Africa among white people is six times higher than if you had to compare it against, you know, European rates or US rates. So I did stories around that to, to sort of, you know, not neutralize the issue, but to show that I had an understand, or that I had sensitivity towards it. I don't have all the answers to you. I, 
I, all I can do is I can acknowledge that there are definitely challenges that I face, that all of us face. And I can just say that we, it's important what Matuba say, there is science, but we also must acknowledge that the science um, is announced or happens in a reality, and, and realities that have, you know, real things that relate to perceptions and to how you talk about people. And we do need to be sensitive, you know, when we um, bring across that science on, you know, how people would perceive it and to be respectful. Thank you, Mia.